Yeah, thank you uh, for the introduction and also uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me here. It's a great honor to take part in this 100-year uh, uh, conference. So the title is uh, the, the Linear Stability of the Schwarzschild Solution Under Gravitational Perturbations. So let me start by uh, reminding you of the, uh, uh, of the Schwarzschild solution, which is the simplest non-trivial solution of the uh, vacuum Einstein equations. And um, the only thing I, of course, all know this, I want you to um, sort of um, remember is that it's uh, static. So there is a, a, a killing field, which is time-like on the black hole exterior, which becomes null on the event horizon, which is located at r equals uh, 2m, and that the metric is also spherically symmetric. Uh, okay, so we all know that the, um, that the uh, Schwarzschild uh, family is part of a, a larger family, the two-parameter curve family, whose nonlinear stability we're interested in. But since this was uh, talked about uh, on uh, Tuesday in, in Mihaly's talk, where he introduced also the conjecture, I will just um, skip this and go straight to the, uh, uh, to the uh, main theorem of the talk. So let me give you a, a first version of the, of the statement. So the statement is the following, that uh, you consider the system of equations which is obtained by linearizing the Einstein equations with respect to a fixed Schwarzschild metric of mass m. Uh, so this is the system of, of gravitational perturbations. Then you, uh, you prescribe initial data for the system. You impose uh, suitable uh, bounds on the, on the initial data. And then the evolution converges up to infinitesimal diffeomorphisms to a member of the linearized curve family of solutions. OK. Now, uh, there are a lot of uh, phrases in this, uh, in this version of the theorem that uh, I will explain to you uh, in, the, uh, in the course of the talk. And I will start with uh, sort of the, 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 the first thing, namely uh, I have to tell you what I mean by the linearized Einstein equations. That is to say I have to tell you how I linearize them and uh, you know, what, um, um, what uh, coordinates I choose and you know, what is the system of gravitational perturbations that, uh, that I eventually um, obtain. And then, then in the second part, I will uh, do the estimates. I will show you how you do estimates on the system of, uh, of, of gravitational perturbations. And on the, uh, on the way, we'll uh, also uh, explain what you know, exactly I mean by infinitesimal diffeomorphisms and uh, the, the linearized curve family of solutions. OK. Um, so as, uh, um, as said, so the first part will be the, uh, uh, to explain the linearization procedure and the system of equations. OK, so how do we, um, how do we go about this? Uh, well, uh, we, um, uh, we start by fixing the, the Eddington-Finkelstein uh, differential structure of the, uh, of the Schwarzschild metric, the UV um, uh, and angular coordinates. And uh, uh, we consider a one-parameter family of uh, Lorentzian metrics uh, in these uh, uh, coordinates u and v, which are double null coordinates, and which are such. So this is my, uh, my, my one-parameter family. And uh, so the, uh, if epsilon is 0, it's just the Schwarzschild metric of uh, mass m. So I know what the, um, so what do we have here? So clearly u and v are null coordinates. So hypersurface of constant u and uh, constant v are null. They intersect in um, uh, topological spheres with uh, metric G, G slash. And then there is a, 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 some, a, shift, uh, a shift B, which is a one form on the, uh, on the spheres. And there is this lapse function, um, uh, omega squared epsilon. So this is a choice. This is my choice of, uh, of coordinates. I have a one parameter family um, uh, in this form. And any metric can locally be put into, um, into this form. And you may ask, uh, so why? Uh, why do we choose this, uh, this, uh, this, this particular form? Well, you'll see that sort of later in the talk, but already uh, historically, uh, this uh, double null gauge has been used uh, with great success in the analysis of the, uh, uh, of the uh, nonlinear Einstein vacuum equation. So many of the breakthroughs in the last uh, five, seven years or so uh, have been obtained uh, using that uh, gauge. So starting with the, um, the work of Chris Dulo on the formation of trapped surfaces, the work of uh, Kleinemann and Rodniansky, the, the theory of impulsive gravitational uh, waves of Luke Rodniansky, and on Tuesday in the talks of both Mihalis and uh, Jonathan, we heard um, another success of, uh, uh, of this particular gauge. OK, so that's our, that's our one parameter uh, family. So associated with, uh, uh, with this family is uh, a family of, of null frames. Uh, 
so, uh, the, so E3 and E4 are, are null vectors. I normalize them so that um, uh, their product is, uh, is minus two. And there's also a, um, a frame on the, uh, on the, on the spheres. Uh, now, uh, we can compute with respect to that frame all the uh, connection coefficients, which I collectively denote by, uh, uh, by gamma. So I give you one example, which is particularly nice and, uh, and geometric. And if you look um, on uh, the board, this, this, this is what it is. So if you compute, uh, for instance, this, uh, this uh, uh, connection uh, coefficients, then uh, you have the, the following picture. So you, you consider a hypersurface of, of constant u, which is, a null, uh, which is a null hypersurface, which is foliated by these uh, spheres. So if e4 is tangent to this, uh, to this null cone, <laughs> oops. And uh, what you, um, uh, is tangent to this null cone. So uh, what this uh, connection coefficients corresponds to is just the second fundamental form of these spheres, how they sit in the, uh, in the, in the null cones. And from this object, you can construct the, uh, the, the trace and the traceless part. And if you check what these things are for the, uh, for the Schwarzschild family, you see that uh, chi hat will be zero and trace chi, which I put an, an omega here to make it a regular quantity. Uh, on, the, on the horizon has this value. Okay, and the notation that I'll use is that, so the one parameter family is printed in bold, and now I go to the, uh, to the, to the linearization, to the, to the quantities of order epsilon, and they typically have a one, this doesn't work somehow so well, um, uh, have a one uh, on top of it, and I'm allowing myself to drop this one if the quantity already vanishes in, uh, in Schwarzschild. Okay, so uh, in this way, you obtain um, a list of, um, of, of, of linearized metric and, and connection coefficients, which uh, I've just given you here. So uh, uh, remember that the, the, uh, the dynamical things are this metric G here, the, um, the, the omega and the B, and these are the, the, the linearized uh, versions thereof. So this is, again, the traceless part of this G slash. Is there another um, thing? I think this is the battery of this. Is yeah, but it just works for one second and then it becomes very. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, and this, so chi and chi, chi by hat, I just, uh, I just talked about. This is the, uh, the, the, the trace part. And again, uh, I emphasize that sometimes when you don't, uh, when you don't see the one, it just, um, it's also a linearized quantity, but um, then the, the Schwarzschild background value uh, vanishes. Okay, fine. So then uh, you do the same thing for the, um, uh, for the curvature. That is, you decompose it uh, with respect to the, uh, uh, to the null frame that, uh, that, that I introduced. And that gives you these uh, null curvature components, alpha, alpha bar, beta, uh, beta bar, and, uh, and rho and sigma. The good thing is that uh, oh, if you compute these things for, uh, for epsilon equals zero, then uh, the only non-vanishing uh, background value is this, uh, um, this row value, which is the Schwarzschild value, which is minus 2m over r cubed. And again, I denote the linearized quantities by uh, non-bolded uh, non letters, and only rho has a 1. I sometimes put the 1 on all, on all quantities, but you know, if it's missing, it just um, means that the background value uh, vanishes. Okay, that's, uh, that's very good. Now, uh, what is the uh, what is the set of uh, what is the set of equations? Well, uh, I um, um, uh, what what uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at the, the, the Bianchi equations for, uh, for for the curvature and the, the structure equation for the for the connection coefficients. Remember, I collectively denoted them by um, by gamma. And all you do now, because I told you sort of how to compute uh, all these things and how to expand them to order epsilon, you just write out these. Um, you just write out the equations, and you keep the terms which are um, which are order epsilon. So roughly, uh, roughly speaking, what will happen um, is that uh, if you linearize the first, there is the uh, the part which is um, uh, coming from the background background connection and and linearized uh, curvature, and then there's a, something coming from the linearized connection here with the background uh, curvature. And similarly, for the, for the second equation, there's a, a background term and uh, there's a curvature term on the right-hand side. Okay, now, a uh, quick observation for Minkowski. Of course, the, if you linearize with respect to Minkowski, the, the background curvature would vanish, and the first equation would, uh, would uh, decouple from, uh, from the second. And this is exploited in um, the uh, paper of, um, or, I should say the, the decoupled equation, the first equation is studied in 
the, uh, uh, the, the famous work of Christel Dulle and Kleinemann on um, the, uh, the, the spin two equations on, on Minkowski space. But around Schwarzschild, there, there is a non-trivial background curvature, and you'll see this term uh, in, in a second. Okay, so now let me give you, let me give you the, the, the system. So the system is this on these three, uh, three, three slides. And, uh, well, okay, the talk will not depend on you knowing, uh, knowing what all these equations are. Uh, I just want to uh, sort of um, make you less scared about these, these equations. So one of them, that's uh, the one in the, in the um, top line on the, on the right-hand side. If we look at it, we see that it's, uh, it's, it's precisely of this, uh, um, of, of this form that there's a, uh, um, this is really annoying. Uh, so the, 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 second, the, the second equation is a, uh, has a, um, a derivative of a, of a, linearized, um, a linearized connection coefficient and curvature on the right-hand side, and that's exactly sort of what you see. Yeah. So this is what I'm. This is the equation that I'm talking about, um, uh, and uh, there's also an analog for 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 chi bar, chi bar next to it. I mean, I'm 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 just trying to illustrate that uh, that uh, you know this is what it is. So this, these are the Bianchi equations for the for the curvature. And again, I just want to put emphasis on the um, last term in the uh, in the first uh, equation, which is precisely the background curvature. Remember, rho was two m over r cubed or something, which couples to a to a linearized uh, connection uh, connection coefficient. So this is the system. Um, this is the system of uh, uh, of gravitational perturbation. So if you see a nabla three, it's always uh, 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 well, it's always the derivative in the u uh, in the d by d u direction. So this is e three. And this is um, this is e4, and all these uh, these fancy slashed uh, things that you see there. These are just um, uh, derivatives which are tangent to the um, to to the spheres. But you know all this is not uh, not uh, not not terribly important. What is important is that you know from now on all the operators that you saw in, in uh, on, on these three slides are defined with respect to Schwarzschild. Okay, so you now we can forget about the family. We can forget about epsilon. This is the system um, of uh, of gravitational perturbations. And this system is not new. I mean, it's, in fact, uh, well known in the physics literature, at least at the, at the level of mode decomposed um, uh, solution, solutions. But, uh, and it's usually expressed in the, in the Newman-Penrose formalism. So instead of uh, alpha, uh, beta, rho, sigma, what you see is psi naught, psi one, uh, psi two. Um, but you know what's remarkable is that the, that uh, the the theory can be formulated completely in physical space for this for this linearized system. Uh, it admits a well post initial value uh, problem with initial data satisfying uh, constraint equations. And in fact, you know this will be precisely precisely the the, the setup that uh, that we study. So we have now have this big system um, this big system of uh, uh, of gravitational perturbations, and we're going to uh, prescribe a characteristic. Uh, initial data, so one has to think a bit what the free data is and how you um, then solve the, um, the, 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 the constraints. But this is, the, this is somehow the, the setup. We study the initial value problem for, this, uh, for the system of, um, of gravitational perturbations. Okay, of course, you know, one should say that this is uh, not the only way to, to study the problem. I told you in the very beginning that we choose this double null uh, gauge because uh, you know, it has uh, certain advantages, but um, uh, historically this is not how, um, how, how people at least began studying, um, studying this problem. So um, we should mention the, 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 the first work on this, the pioneering work by Reggie Wheeler in 57. And uh, you know, this was all at the level of, uh, of metric perturbations. Um, and at the level of, of mode decomposed uh, solution. So not at the level of curvature. Remember, we, we are going to estimate um, curvature uh, perturbations. And uh, yeah, one should also mention the, um, the, um, uh, the nice uh, paper of Moncrief, who, who has a gauge invariant, or introduced a gauge invariant approach in the context of, um, of metric perturbations. Okay, so now, uh, I told you what the uh, what the system is, or how you how you obtain the uh, the system of gravitational uh, perturbations. So now let me tell you how uh, how you do analysis for for this system. 
Okay, so before we, uh, before we get into the, the analysis uh, proper, uh, I want to tell you something about special solutions of, uh, of this system. So one class of, uh, of special solutions is uh, what we call pure gauge solutions, or what should be called uh, pure gauge solutions. So, so what are those? Uh, well, you know, I told you that I choose this, uh, uh, the double null, um, the, the double null uh, gauge, which, uh, which was this, uh, 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 arose from, uh, from uh, which, which we, in which we wrote this, uh, this one, uh, one parameter family. But actually, this doesn't fix the gauge completely. So if you imagine that uh, in, the, um, in, in the first line, you did a coordinate transformation to order epsilon, and you, uh, um, you know, arbitrary coordinate transformation, then there are some coordinate transformation which keep the metric in this double null uh, form. Okay, so omega will change by a term which is of order epsilon, uh, g slash will change by a term which is of order epsilon, and so on. So this is just a coordinate change, which at the linearized level uh, that we have just corresponds to, you know, a certain exact solution of the, uh, of the system of, of gravitational perturbations. And I've given you this, uh, this lemma here, so you can uh, parameterize such a, um, um, such a gauge solution. So I give you a, a, a function uh, f of the, um, of the uh, adding Finkelstein coordinates uh, v, uh, theta, and phi, then, you know, these expressions for the, uh, for the metric coefficient, so I've, I've not written down everything with curvature and connection coefficients, just the, uh, the, the metric perturbations, but you can work out explicitly, thank you, um, you can work out explicitly how, um, uh, you can work out explicitly how the, um, um, you know, what the, what the quantities are, and that will become important uh, later. But it's very important to realize that there are these solutions, and if you, you know, if you look at the evolution of this, uh, of this problem and you're converging to one of, uh, you know, you're not converging to zero, but you're converging to one of those solutions, you want to declare this as also converging to zero because it's nothing but a, um, uh, you know, nothing but a coordinate change, if you like. Okay. So this, the, the second class of, uh, of, of special solutions is given by the, uh, the linearized uh, Kerr solution. So how do you obtain uh, those? Well, uh, you just put the, the Kerr metric in this double null gauge, and you linearize with respect to the angular momentum parameter A, and then you read off again what all these, uh, what all these quantities are, and this is your, your, your linearized Kerr solutions. And uh, you know, their characteristic feature is somehow that you can read them off from the, um, from the curvature component sigma, it's precisely the L equals one mode of the, uh, of the curvature, component, um, uh, curvature component sigma. All right. Um, so now let's, uh, let's turn to the, um, uh, let's turn to the, uh, the, the analysis uh, proper. So it's, it's long been known um, in, the, in the physics literature that uh, there exists gauge invariant uh, null curvature components, which in our language are called alpha and, and alpha bar, which satisfy a decoupled uh, wave equation. Okay, this is the so-called uh, Tokolsky equation, or in, uh, in the context of, of, of Schwarzschild, it's just the, uh, uh, the, the body and, uh, press equation, which was uh, both, both, both papers, I think, are, um, are, are 70, uh, 73. And this uh, decoupling, by the way, persists for Kerr. I mean, I'm only talking about Schwarzschild, but the fact that uh, these uh, two null curvature components um, um, are gauge invariant and decouple in, in linear theory is true also for, um, for Kerr. So how, how should you think of this decoupled, uh, decoupled wave equation? Well, you can think about it in terms of uh, you know, a wave equation for, uh, for, the, for the component alpha, which has a potential and which is also a first order, uh, a first order term. And, uh, you know, people tried very hard to do analysis on the system, again, at the level of sort of mode uh, decomposed solution, but uh, the only statement that was known about the, the, the Tarkovsky equation uh, was the statement of mode stability, which uh, was proved by Whiting for the, for the more general um, Kerr. Um, Kerr case. But even the statement of, of uniform boundedness, that is to say, you know, you look at uh, the evolution of, of initial data and you just want to show that alpha solution, the solution alpha remains uniformly bounded, this was not known. 
Okay. Um, so now, how do you um, how do you how do you resolve this? Uh, well, it turns out there exists uh, um, uh, there exists a certain uh, hierarchy of uh, of gauge invariant quantities, uh, and that's what I'm going to explain to you now. So you can define from the uh, from the decoupled quantity alpha and uh, and alpha bar um, two new quantities psi and psi bar, which uh, which I've written there, which are just you know uh, essentially you know a, a three derivative uh, applied to alpha or a four derivative uh, applied to alpha bar, and then you go one level further. So uh, you apply another uh, three derivative to the new quantity psi. You get a quantity p. And you apply a four derivative to the uh, quantity psi bar, and you get a quantity p bar. Uh, now, what you see on the on the right hand side here is just what happens if you actually using the the Bianchi equation. So, nabla three uh, nabla three alpha satisfies also uh, um, uh, an equation, the Bianchi equation. So you can compute what this is on the on the right hand side, and similarly for the quantities p. Uh, and p bar, so you can relate them back to to things which appear in the system of, of gravitational perturbations. But you know, I should emphasize that you don't have to do that at this point. You just have the Tarkovsky equation, and you you know you 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 apply this at the end of the day second order e operator to alpha uh, and alpha bar, and you get these quantities p and p bar. And you don't have to refer back to the to the whole system of um, of gravitational perturbations for for this. Okay, so these again, <laughs> these transformations are not um, are not new. They 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 appear in the um, in at, again at the level of mode solutions in the in the work of um, of, of of Chandrasekhar. Uh, so what's the point of doing this? <laughs> what's the point of doing this uh, this this transformation? Well, the point is the following: that um, if you look at these quantities p and p bar and the equation that they satisfy, then you observe that they satisfy. Uh, the Reggie Wheeler equation, which uh, okay, I'm going to have on my on my next slide, but which you should think is an equation for which you don't have the first order term that you have in the um, uh, in the Tarkovsky equation. So it's a wave equation with a potential, and the potential is um, well has the right sign or is sufficiently good that you can um, uh, that you can actually prove both. So you have a positive conserved energy for the Reggie Wheeler equation, and also an integrated um, an integrated decay estimate. Okay, so needless to say, of course, that uh, if you want to restrict your perturbations to, to symmetric ones, then um, everything is still true. P and P bar will still satisfy the Reggie Wheeler equation. So, what's the point of, um, of the another important point of the quantities P and, and P bar? Well, they're symmetric uh, traceless tensors, so in particular, they don't see uh, the L equals 1 Kerr modes. So, that's good news because if I prove decay for p and p bar, it means that this is consistent with there being these modes which don't decay, these, these uh, linearized uh, Kerr solutions. Okay, another thing that uh, you of course have to, to think about is that you know, once, you have, uh, once you have decay estimates for, um, once you have decay estimates for, uh, for p and p bar, how do you go back, uh, so remember that, um, uh, remember that, um, yeah, p was given by a uh, three derivative of, of p and alpha, um, uh, so a three derivative of alpha is equal to um, to, to p. So how how do you get back from p alpha and alpha bar? So how do you how 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 does this sort of imply that you have um, decay for the Tarkovsky equation? Okay, so let me let me first give an overview of the the analysis of the of the Reggie Wheeler equation, and then tell you how you go back once you have estimates for the decay estimates for the Reggie Wheeler equation. How you go back. Uh, and get estimates for uh, for for p, psi, psi bar, and and alpha and alpha bar. Okay, so the the I've put the Reggie Wheeler equation um, uh, here. Uh, so it's it's a wave equation, and there's a uh, there's a there's a potential term uh, here. So uh, it's very easy. It's a uh, very easy computation to to derive the, the the conserved energy. Just multiply by dt phi and and integrate by parts. So there is a positive conserved energy for for this equation. Moreover, there is a version of the uh, of the redshift estimate that you have for the standard uh, for the standard wave equation, and you can show an integrated decay estimate, which was uh, shown in uh, work of uh, Blue and Soffer, and it's also in uh, in my work on the the ultimately uh, Schwarzschildian uh, space time. And it's precisely here in the integrated decay estimate where the phenomenon of trapping that 
played a crucial role in the previous talk uh, enters. And you know, once once you have this, once you have these two estimates, the the um, the, the the boundedness es estimate that you get from the conserved energy and the redshift, and the integrated decay estimate, um, you uh, you know you can just apply the the black box results of um, the famous Rodnianski, uh, Schlu, and a uh, very general result of, of Moschidis to go from uh, these I this integrated decay to polynomial decay rates for the energy and also pointwise uh, point estimates. I should say that we actually, uh, because the thing is so, so simple, I mean, these theorems, you know, they hold for general asymptotically flat um, uh, space time. So, uh, you know, in this very simple case, it doesn't take too long to actually reproof, um, to reproof these, uh, these results. So that's what we do. Okay, so this is this is sort of the overview, and uh, you know the upshot of this is that you know everything that you can do for the uh, everything that you can do for the wave equation, you can do for the Reggie Wheeler equation. Okay, so uh, let me go in a bit more detail. So what do I mean by um, you know that everything that can be done for the um, for the wave equation can be done for the Reggie Wheeler equation, and let me uh, spend uh, I don't know ten minutes or so. Uh, to tell you a little bit about what's known um, for the uh, for the linear wave equation on on black holes, because this is what we have to do for this for this Reggie Wheeler equation. Okay, so the 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 statement that has now been uh, been obtained after a um, long period of um, of work by 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 many different groups is uh, the, the the following statement that if you look at solutions of the of the linear wave equation. For a subextremal member of the um, of the Kerr uh, family, then um, the, um, the the scalar field psi uh, decays polynomially in time on the black hole exterior. Okay, so this is a statement for uh, for the whole Kerr family of uh, of solutions. But uh, the way this uh, this final theorem was uh, was approached was of course, of course to first look at the simplest case, which is the case of of, of interest for us. Uh, here, which is the case where the angular momentum um, uh, per unit mass is equal to zero. Uh, so uh, the, the, the first uh, work was the, the, the work of, of uh, K and Walt, which proved uh, boundedness uh, for, uh, for, for solutions. And then there was work by Defamos Ronjanski and, and Blue and Sturbins, which uh, proved uh, decay. And then uh, uh, people considered the, the very slowly rotating uh, um, uh, case, so there were three independent proofs, and then finally, uh, I think last year also the, um, the, uh, the, the full case, the full, full sub-extremal case was, was covered. Uh, Okay, just a few few remarks on on this theorem. This theorem fails in the extremal case due to the Aratakis instability. Uh, um, certain transversal derivatives uh, on the horizon actually uh, grow in time. Uh, a version of this theorem has been uh, proven for, for Maxwell's equation in, in, the, in the slowly rotating case by Anderson and Blue, and for um, by, by Blue in the in, in the Maxwell case. And there are also generalizations to to uh, to Kerr de Zitter. And in the last talk, uh, we heard about generalizations of this to Kerr, Kerr anti desitter and we also learned that the dynamics there is much more uh, rich somehow than in the, um, in the asymptotically flat case. Okay, so let me, let, me, um, let me explain what sort of at the level of, of the analysis for the, uh, for the wave equation are the, the, uh, the, 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 crucial, the crucial ingredients. So, so for this, it's good to go go again back uh, one step to, um, to 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 Minkowski space. So recall that uh, if you uh, if you wanted to prove uh, decay for the uh, for the for the wave equation on, on Minkowski space, there are uh, tons of ways to uh, to do this. But the, the, if you want to do it via the the, the vector field method, then uh, typically you uh, you um, or one way to do it is via two, uh, two estimates. So the first estimate you, you somehow you get for free, which is just the energy uh, conservation that you have for the, for the wave equation. And the second estimate is the integrated local energy decay estimate. So what is, uh, what is this statement? Uh, well, if you, if you look at this, it just, uh, uh, well, okay, maybe I don't have to draw it. I mean, you see it from, from, uh, from, what's going, from what's going on here. So you, you restrict the energy to, to a ball um, of, of radius r, but you also integrate it in time, and you still control it for, uh, by, the, uh, by the energy on your, uh, on your initial data. 
Okay, so these are the two uh, the two fundamental estimates uh, that uh, that you need, and then again, you know, you, you um, from these you derive uh, all the rest, the polynomial decay rates and point wise and uh, and so on. So once you have these two, you're you're in good shape. So already in the Schwarzschild case, if you try to um, if you try to reprove um, these two estimates, there um, uh, there um, well, there are two two difficulties that you have to that you have to address. And uh, it requires the understanding of two, um, uh, two different um, uh, or two, two, two phenomena. One is the, uh, the redshift um, effect uh, near the event horizon, which you need to, uh, to prove boundedness, and uh, you need to understand the, the trapping at the, the photon sphere to, to prove decay. Again, I should say that the Kerr case is much more complicated, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to explain you, um, you know, how these two fundamental features of, of black holes sort of influence the analysis uh, in the sense that, you know, how they change how you should think about these two estimates. Okay, so let's start with the, uh, with the, with the redshift effect. So remember what I said at the, at the very beginning of the, uh, of the talk, that Schwarzschild has this, uh, this globally uh, causal uh, killing field on the exterior, d by dt, which uh, becomes null on the event horizon. So the fact that it, uh, it degenerates on the, uh, on the event horizon and becomes null means that if you, you, know, if you, if you try to prove the analog of, of the energy conservation that we had in Minkowski space, what you see is somehow an estimate uh, like, the, um, like the, the energy estimate, or in fact it's a uh, conservation if you include the term on the, on the event horizon, but the, 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 the characteristic feature of, um, of, of this estimate is that um, that it degenerates near the event horizon. So you, you see, uh, you see all, all derivatives of C, but the transversal ones, the, the derivatives transversal uh, to the horizon, um, they degenerate. So you have this weight of 1 minus 2m over r, which becomes 0 as you approach the, the event horizon. So clearly this estimate is not good enough, the, the estimate that you get for free from d by dt, to, to prove boundedness of the solution along the event horizon. And the... Um, the, the redshift effect is precisely about removing this degeneracy at, um, at r equals uh, 2m to uh, remove this and to get a non-degenerate uh, boundedness statement. And once you have this, you can uh, commute, use elliptic estimates, Sobolev embedding, and so on, and you get, um, well, all the estimates that, that you want for boundedness, right? Uh, right, so now let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, let's talk a little bit about um, decay. Um, so, the, um, I mean, Jacques already, uh, already talked about this. In fact, I wanted to recycle his um, diagram and just add a, a null boundary to it, but now I have to uh, put it in here. So, there is this uh, time-like hypersurface at, at r equals 3m, and uh, you have uh, these null geodesics, which uh, always remain in this, uh, this time-like uh, hypersurface and neither escape through the event horizon nor uh, through the... Uh, through null infinity. So, uh, of course, in the high frequency approximation of uh, solutions to the wave equation uh, travel along null geodesics, so you can imagine sort of uh, having a wave whose energy concentrates for arbitrarily long times along this, um, uh, along this r equals uh, uh, 3m. And uh, what this means at the level of analysis or at the level of the, of the estimates is that uh, what you can prove uh, so this is exactly the same left-hand side that you had in the estimate uh, that I showed you for, for Minkowski space, but on the right-hand side, you see uh, that you need one more derivative of, of psi. So it's associated with a, uh, with a loss of derivatives, and this loss is actually ne necessary, as was shown in uh, work of, um, of Jan um, Spierski. And, I mean, Jacques already talked about uh, various manifestations of this trapping phenomenon, so I, I won't talk... Um, won't talk much more about this. But these are somehow the two difficulties, the two geometric difficulties that you have to understand uh, in order, to, um, in order to, prove, um, to prove the decay. Okay, fine. Uh, so let's go back. So remember, I, I, I derived for you the, uh, I derived for you the, the, uh, the, the Reggie Wheeler equation. And in the last 10 minutes, I told you that everything that you can do for the wave equation, you can do for the, for the Reggie Wheeler equation. So now we're at the stage that you know, we know everything that we, uh, that we could wish for, for p and, and p bar. Now, how do, I, um, uh, how do I get the other quantities and how do I get, go back to alpha and, uh, and alpha bar? Okay, so uh, 
this is the uh, the next theorem. Again, this is this theorem is only about the gauge invariant quantity, so it's not a reformulation of the uh, of the theorem that I stated in the beginning, but it's sort of a a, a, a sub theorem, I mean, which addresses the, the the gauge invariant quantities. So the the, the statement is the following: that um, again, you're in this in the um, in the in the setting of of starting with um, with uh, characteristic data for the for the system of gravitational perturbations, and uh, you look at the gauge invariant quantities uh, p, c, and alpha, and p bar, c bar, alpha, then they satisfy boundedness and integrated decay estimates. And uh, yeah, moreover, uh, the quantity to, quantities decay both in energy and pointwise at, um, at polynomial rates. Okay, so how, how, is, this, uh, how is this done? Well, the, <laughs> the proof is very easy uh, once you have, um, uh, once you have um, the integrated decay estimate for the uh, for the quantity p that I promised to you. Uh, so um, just so for, for p and p bar, we already discussed at length that we have the decay. Uh, and now you just look at the uh, the evolution equation for psi. So if you remember, uh, if you remember, psi was essentially the three derivative of alpha. Uh, and uh, sorry, I'm I'm here. So uh, uh, p is the three derivative of psi. Right, so the only thing that I'm going to do with this equation, modulo th these weights, is to multiply it by psi, okay? In which, after which I get, uh, after which I get this, okay? So uh, now you just stick in an, uh, an r to the n into the into the bracket, and uh, so whenever you see an omega s squared, this is just one minus. 2m over r. Okay, so you use that uh, if you differentiate r with respect to uh, the Eddington Finkel. Maybe it's me who. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't seem to. Oh, now it's coming back. Um, Okay, so uh, you just stick in this uh, this weight of uh, of r to the n. Of course, when the du hits the r to the n, you get a minus omega s uh, squared. So you have to add uh, this term on the right hand side. You see this. So you just integrate this uh, in both u and v, and you just <laughs> you just apply Cauchy-Schwarz on the right hand side to absorb sort of the psi term in the good positive term that you have on the left hand side, and this. If you integrate over uh, over space time, you know by the integrated decay estimate that you proved for for p in the context of Reggie Wheeler, uh, you know that um, uh, you have control over this. So the the argument for alpha is very similar because remember that uh, the three derivative of alpha was just psi, so you just repeat the argument uh, one level uh, one level further further down. And uh, of course for the for the Bard quantities, it's completely similar. Note, however, that you know it, this. So sort of what's, what's very important here is that the weights in R and the weights near the horizon work out correctly. So whenever you, um, when, um, uh, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's the only thing that you can, uh, so the, the N here you have to choose suitably and you have to be careful about the weights uh, near the horizon that you, uh, that, that you put in there. But, but that's really it. I mean, that, uh, as far as the, the, the gauge invariant quantities uh, are concerned, <laughs> you know, once uh, somebody gives you the, 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 the quantity P or tells you the transformation, um, it, uh, you know, it's really very easy to, to get it for the, um, for the for, to get decay for the gauge invariant quantities. So in particular, you have as a corollary that uh, solutions to the Tarkovsky equation decay inverse polynomially in time, which, if you remember, was was previously not known. Right. Okay. So so that uh, that's that's it as far as the, the 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 gauge invariant part of the solution is concerned. But uh, now, how do we estimate uh, the rest? And that's actually where the um, uh, well, where, where where the interesting aspects, if you want, uh, come in. Uh, so let me let me talk a little bit about uh, about how you how you do that. Uh, for this for this it's it's good if you remember the one equation that I, I picked out from the um, uh, from this horrible slides with the with the equations, uh, which was if you remember which was an equation uh, for the for um, for the um, uh, for the Ricci coefficient linearized Ricci coefficient chi hat which had curvature alpha on the right hand side. Right. Remember that I, I, I told you now that for alpha, you know everything that you could possibly want 
to know, namely that, that alpha decays. So this seems like uh, a good equation to get, uh, to get, um, to get decay for, uh, for, for chi hat, because you know that the right-hand side decays. However, if you, uh, and I should also, I should also say that, uh, you know, whenever you see these, um, these weights here, um, you, um, you, um, because we're working with, with sort of with, uh, with the Eddington-Finkelstein frame, the quantity, the quantity which is actually regular is chi hat times this omega Schwarzschild. And the quantity which is regular is alpha times omega s squared. So that's, I've written everything here so that the quantities are regular. Uh, so, uh, you know, th this is just the correctly weighted, uh, weighted quantity that you want to estimate. But now you look at this and you see that uh, this term uh, will give you an exponential growth. Okay, so um, this is what's, uh, you know, what you could call a, a blue shift. So what, you know, what you want to do is you want to, um, so again, we're, this is our setting, right? We now know that here in the, in the exterior we have decay for, for alpha for all the gauge invariant quantities. And now we want to, uh, you know, estimate uh, psi in the E4 direction. So we use a transport equation for, um, for chi hat in the, um, in, the, in the four direction, which will give us, I don't know, uh, chi hat here in terms of the initial data and something, um, uh, uh, something um, with, with alpha. But you can't do that because of this, uh, this blue shift effect. So uh, what you need to do in order, to, um, in order to, to resolve this is you actually need to commute this equation with uh, the redshift vector field uh, uh, which in Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates would just be one over omega s squared d by du. So, so this vector field extends regularly to the, um, to the event horizon. So if you do that, um, you, you will see that the commutator, when you do it the first time, you, you, you commute, and the commutator will precisely remove this term. Okay? So, uh, and on the right-hand side, nothing dangerous is going to happen because the three derivative hits, hits alpha and we're going to see psi, which we also know everything uh, about. Okay, so then now we've removed the, the, the blue shift term, but since that went so well, we just do it again uh, and we commute a, a second time by, um, uh, a second time by, uh, by this redshift vector field, in which case this sign here changes into a plus sign and here on the right-hand side, we're going to see p. Right, because we're taking another, uh, another three derivative. And now you have a redshift term, which in principle would give you exponential decay, but uh, because you have a right-hand side, chi hat only satisfies uh, whatever you have on the, um, the right-hand side. So in this way, of course, again, then you have to go back, right? So now you're showing, um, uh, you're showing a decay estimate for two, three derivatives of chi hat, and then you have to go back to, to chi hat, and this requires that you know additional fluxes on the event horizon, which you can in turn obtain from the, uh, from the gauge invariant um, uh, quantities. Because remember, so if you have uh, nabla three, uh, if you have something like nabla three chi hat, if you control this, then you want to integrate from the horizon using that you have control on nabla three uh, chi hat, but for this you need to know certain things about chi hat on the, on the event horizon, but you know this from the gauge invariant, uh, from the gauge invariant quantities. If you uh, restrict suitably to the horizon. Okay, uh, so that's that's what you do for that's what you do for for chi hat. The similar thing works for um, for um, for beta, but there are some quantities, um, for instance, the quantity uh, chi bar hat, for which you can only show boundedness but not decay. So if you try to to do the to do a, a similar argument for um, for chi bar hat, it just doesn't work. Okay, so why is that? Well, before I give you, before I give you the answer, uh, I, just want to, um, uh, I just want to state what, what, what you can prove at this stage. And that's the, the, uh, the statement that, um, so you consider a solution S, so by S I just mean all geometric quantities of, of that solution. Uh, of the system of gravitational uh, perturbations arising from smooth uh, seed initial data, then uh, all geometric quantities satisfy weighted boundedness estimates. So for instance, this quantity uh, chi bar hat, again, I have to put this uh, omega s to the minus one here to make it a regular quantity. I also weight it uh, near, near null infinity. This quantity is bounded. This metric, um, metric perturbation is bounded and also curvature is bounded. And you know, I could fill a slide with all the estimates that you prove, but I'm just, uh, 
giving you a, uh, a glimpse. Okay, so, so, so you have boundedness for all the geometric quantities, but you don't have, um, you don't have uh, decay. So why don't you have decay? Uh, well, this is related to uh, something that we, uh, we discussed earlier, namely with the, uh, with the notion of the pure gauge solutions. Um, so how, uh, how does this, uh, this uh, come about? Well, let's write, uh, uh, let's write again S as representing all geometric quantities of the solution in the initial data gauge. So what do I mean by initial data gauge? Well, um, so you, uh, you start with initial data for the system of gravitational perturbations, and then you still have this freedom of adding pure gauge solutions to prepare your data in the correct, uh, in the correct gauge. And you can use that, uh, that freedom to set you know, certain quantities, for instance, to be zero on the, on the horizon. And that's what you do to put the solution in the, um, uh, in the initial data gauge. So, all the, so once you've, you've put the solution in the initial data gauge, uh, you, you look at the evolution of, of, of the solution, and I denote by S all the geometric quantities of that, uh, of that solution. Well, uh, of course, I'm always free to, um, uh, to, uh, to add to my solution uh, a pure gauge solution, right? Which, if you remember, was generated by, this, uh, by a function f. I gave you this little lemma that if, if you give me a function, uh, a function f, I can construct for you a, um, a solution of the system of, of gravitational perturbations. Uh, so I want, to, uh, I want to call by, uh, by S nu the sum of, the, um, uh, of, of, um, of my solution in the initial data gauge plus uh, a pure gauge solution that I, uh, that I add to it. So how do I determine this, uh, this, this function f? Well, uh, this, uh, this gauge function f uh, is determined dynamically from the old solution from the, 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 the solution that I'm, that I'm looking at by solving an ODE along the event horizon. Okay, and once I add, so I have, I have this solution, then I add a pure gauge solution with, with an F that I determine dynamically from the old solution, and then I consider this, um, uh, uh, the, the, this solution as new, then all the geometric quantities associated uh, with this uh, as new uh, actually decay. Okay, so if I want to see decay, I have to uh, sort of correct my, my coordinates. So what it, what it, what it means in, in terms of interpretation is that, uh, you know, you, you, you converge to Schwarzschild, but you don't converge in the, you know, in the standard coordinates to Schwarzschild. So, you know, you have to, you have to correct for that. And at the linearized level, this means that you have to add, uh, you know, a dynamically determined um, uh, gauge solution. Um, yeah, which, uh, which, which is what we do. So, so then you look at all the, uh, all the quantities and you, have, um, um, you, you, you get the polynomial decay that you want. Okay, so um, this is the, uh, the, the, the summary version of the, um, of, of the theorem with, with uh, many more details, which you now understand. So you consider a solution of the equations of, of linearized gravity or system of gravitational perturbations around uh, Schwarzschild arising from a general asymptotically flat characteristic initial data uh, on a double null cone. So this is this picture. Then you have quantitative boundedness and inverse polynomial uh, decay for the gauge invariant quantities. So this, these were P, uh, C, alpha, and, and, and so on. And in fact, for general solutions of Reggie Wheeler and, uh, and Tarkovsky. So that's what you, you obtain along the way. Uh, in a gauge determined by initial data, you have uh, a boundedness statement. All quantities of the system uh, remain bounded by a constant times uh, their initial values. And in a gauge uh, determined uh, by the future, so by solving this ODE along the, uh, the event uh, horizon, if you add this, uh, this pure gauge solution, then all quantities of the system decay inverse polynomially uh, to a member of the four-dimensional um, standard linearized Kerr uh, solution. The good news is that uh, the, these linearized curve solutions, you can detect them uh, at the level of, uh, of, of the initial data. And uh, the other thing is the, um, the pure gauge solution, so the, the, the gauge change that you have to make, this dynamical uh, gauge transformation, the F, is controlled by your initial data. Okay, so that's, uh, that's sort of important for, um, uh, in particular for, for nonlinear applications. Okay, so that um, ends um, this part of the talk. In, somehow in this room, things happen um, sort of slower than they, they should happen. 
um, but um, I, uh, I came prepared and um, I have a little um, uh, epilogue. Um, so I wanted to um, I wanted to uh, to make the uh, the connection also with uh, the first talk uh, in the in the conference by um, uh, by Bob Walt, um, and I mean this is somehow an, an approach which is a bit orthogonal to uh, to uh, to to what I've already um, talked about, um, but it's it's nevertheless very uh, very interesting, and um, this has to do with the uh, uh, with the following that's that you know if you stare for long enough at the, the system of, of, of gravitational perturbations that, I've, uh, uh, that I've, I've shown you, you discover that uh, actually uh, there exists conservation laws within, uh, within the system, very much like uh, the, uh, the ones that uh, Bob uh, told us about. Um, so I, I, phrased them in, um, I phrased them in the form um, that, uh, that I've used on um, on the slide, so I, I, I phrased them in terms of the, <coughs> the linearized uh, uh, connection coefficients. So what uh, what do we have here? So what what I've what I've defined here is uh, is just uh, certain fluxes. So let's call this um, I don't know u zero v zero. Um, let's call this v one u one. So I've uh, on this slide, I've just defined uh, certain uh, obscure-looking uh, fluxes, which are quadratic in the uh, in the linearized um, in the linearized uh, connection coefficients. And what you see here, so is, this is precisely a flux for a, uh, for a constant uh, for a constant v. So this would be a flux that is uh, defined here, integral from u uh, from u naught to u one, uh, and the other one is the flux in the other direction. So you know, one thing to observe here is that there are some terms which are uh, which are positive definite, and there are some others which are not. Uh, uh, well, at least um, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, they, they don't have a sign, at least not obviously. Um, okay, so so these are the these are these uh, these two fluxes, and I promised you a, a conservation law. So the conservation law that holds for the system of, uh, of gravitational perturbations is uh, a conservation law which precisely relates uh, well, the, the initial fluxes to fluxes at some, uh, some later uh, null hypersurfaces. Okay, so uh, that's very nice. I mean, in principle, we know that such things should, uh, uh, should exist. And it's also, you know, note that this is, a, uh, this is a conservation law which is at the level of uh, first derivatives of the metric. Right, so I mean, you should contrast that with <laughs> with the uh, with the other part of the talk where we went to Tarkovsky, which was already at the level of curvature. Then we took two derivatives of curvature to get to this uh, this quantity p. Um, so so this quantity is at a much uh, at a much lower level. Uh, but of course, the problem, as uh, was um, sort of presented in, in Bob's talk, is that you know you don't really know what to do with these things because they're not positive definite. So they uh, you know they don't give you something coercive. So they don't give you control um, you know over the uh, over the dynamical fields. Uh, but there is um, uh, there is something that that's actually very useful, and uh, this is you know this relies on the observation that these fluxes are actually gauge invariant up to boundary terms, uh, and this. Uh, because now I'm now time is passing too uh, too quickly, uh, so this this conservation law um, uh, you you can actually exploit it in connection with a uh, with a gauge transformation um, to uh, so you know if you are in other words if you are in the if you are in the right uh, if you are in the right gauge uh, um, you can you can make these quantities here this one this one and this one you can make these quantities zero so that you you actually have something uh, which is uh, which is positive definite. And this can be used to uh, to uh, to give you an estimate, uh, an a priori estimate on the uh, on the flux of chi hat through the event horizon, as well as the um, uh, that of chi bar hat uh, through through null infinity. So the uh, the, the theorem that uh, that you obtain is that uh, so you again consider a system a solution to the system of gravitational perturbations. Then uh, you know what you what you control a priori uh, from initial data is the the flux of chi hat. Uh, squared along the event horizon here, and the weighted flux of chi bar hat squared along uh, along null infinity. And okay, I stop.
here. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there questions? Please. Could you go to slide 19? <laughs> yeah, sure. So this uh, last remark on the slide, uh, it's possibly out of date, uh, because in 2014 there was, a letter, uh, there was a paper in the Physical Review Letters that shows uh, R-weighted uh, uniform boundedness for um, gauge invariant curvature scalars uh, for exactly this, this case. So not, not mode stability, but non-mode uniform boundedness. But uniform boundedness, you say? Or yeah. Okay, I'm not aware. So, okay. Maybe. What, do you, what do you mean non general symmetry? Uh, wh what paper are you talking about? There's a paper by Gustavo Dotti. Oh, okay, but this, this uses something different, right? I mean, that, this is that does not apply to give you such a statement, that paper. Okay, well, it shows uniform boundness of gauge invariant curvature scalars that fully determine the gravitational perturbations on Schwarzschild. It's a, um, I mean, maybe we can, okay, we can yeah, talk we about can discuss that. <laughs> well, in particular, it, it doesn't show, I don't think it shows decay to, it to occur. Apply, yeah. It does not apply to general solutions of this equation. You see, to go from p from it, once you have p and p bar to go from uh, from uh, from they, they uh, use different uh, quantities. Yeah, they, I yeah. know they use Reggie Wheeler and and well, really, but it's the same issue that if you transform solutions of one to the other, such transformations are, are never uh, bijective. Oh, <laughs> all right, okay, that's a different issue. All right. <laughs> Next question. Yeah, so actually, do you know if that expression you wrote down in the epilogue is the canonical energy, or I mean possibly up to boundary terms that uh, you yeah, may not? Yeah, I, I, I haven't sort of checked this uh, Let's check this in detail. I mean, the, the funny thing is there there is another conservation law, which is at the level of curvature. So they're, you know, they're, they're different. They're different thing, and it could be that the sum of the two is related to uh, uh, to, to the to the canonical energy or some combination. But I, you know, I haven't investigated um, your, your your slides were too scary. Yeah. Like okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one, uh, I mean, I think there's likely a relationship between the the conservation laws that you were getting with the curvature and. Uh, you know, the canonical energy that I presented in, in the following rather, well, sort of strange indirect way. I mean, it turns out that, it, I mean, if you, you can use solutions of the Tucholsky equation as potentials to generate metric perturbations, mm -hmm. right? I mean, which is, uh, I mean, you really get the adjoint of the Tucholsky equation coming in naturally, but that's the other Tucholsky equation for the other variable. So if you are interested in the Tucholsky equation, you could, taking two derivatives of the Tucholsky variable, construct a metric perturbation, you know, that'll satisfy the linearized Einstein equation. From that, you could construct a canonical energy quantity or whatever. I mean, that quantity, I'm not sure that the, you know, this, this would end up being a quadratic quantity in three derivatives of mm -hmm. the curvature quantity. Uh, if I understood, you have two derivatives, or I'm, I'm not sure. But in, anyway, there may be some relationship. But the energy, of course, then has three. I mean, you, in the energy, you see three. Oh, yeah, OK. So, <laughs> so the energy-like quantity that you may have, I think, has almost surely got to be the canonical energy of the perturbation that you generate using the curvature as a potential. Uh, I mean, I'm saying that on the basis of the fact that there can't be all that many independent conserved right. yeah, quantities yeah, of course. around. Of course. So if there are two, there's almost surely a relation between them. 
of course. I mean, the, you know, one, one nice thing I think about this is that, you know, it, it gives you more than what I, what I told you because it's not, it's not risk, you know, there's one limit that you have to take, but the other limit you actually don't have to take. And you can use these conservation, uh, these conservation laws and this a priori control on some of the quantities to bound solutions of Tarkovsky without going through, you know, through Tarkovsky and these transformations, but you just using the Bianchi, uh, the, the Bianchi equation. So it, it just gives a, um, you know, a, a, another another approach to, to to the problem. I think. <clears throat> Other further questions? Yeah, please, Dimitri. I'd like to say, okay, of course, uh, linearizations are uh, fine and uh, basic. You know, I mean, even the concept of derivative is a linear concept. However, um, we uh, it would be nice to know whether. Uh, let's say, <coughs> some uh, small but uh, finite non-zero change. Uh, what can one say about this? Of course, I know this is a difficult problem, but at least at, let's say, the level of just uh, energy or these basic quantities you were discussing, uh, as to whether this can be understood at a finite but small level, small but finite. And uh, as to whether uh, one can throw then more light into this coordinate change you were talking about to make this quantity positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thanks for the suggestion. I mean, <coughs> thank I you. Are there further comments or questions? Well, if not, we thank the speaker again. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>